Today was the first day. Look, quarterbacks, rookies, selected veterans. Listen, I love football. I'll take what I can get. So joining us now is our 97.3 Eagles insider, John McMullen. He also covers the NFL for today's pigskin. And we'll get into the fact that there were actual players at the NovaCare Center today. Right, John? You're right. Uh, there were players at the NovaCare Complex today. Obviously, it's rookie, scaled-down version, really a glorified mini camp to uh, when real, the real things get started on Thursday, the entire team's first practice. And, and then from there, Saturday will be the first day with pads on. And Sunday is the first open practice at Lincoln Financial Field. And Doug uh, Peterson confirmed today that the Eagles will have pads on and, and so fans will get to see some hitting, which is something I haven't seen in practice for obviously a long time since Chip Kelly was here for three years. You know, the, one of the quotes from the presser when Doug spoke to you guys at the press conference today, he talked about the fact that, you know, we're kind of ramping things up. We hope to get, you know, full throttle Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it seems like according to Doug Peterson's timeline, when that open practice happens Sunday, you're going to see a lot of action going on. Is that right? Yeah, you're going to see him. As I said, you're going to see him in pads, and, and you're going to see some hitting. We'll see how much. But uh, Chip Kelly did not believe in that, uh, did not want his players uh, risking injury in that type of format and that type of situation. So uh, it's going to be a change. And, and you can see the, the theory from both sides. Uh, I, As an old school guy, I kind of lean towards Doug's thought process, and I, I think you need to get used to the hitting. Uh, but obviously, if guys are, are going full bore, uh, there is more of a chance for an injury. So we'll see how things shake out. But uh, it's certainly more traditional NFL environment than it, what it has been over the past three years. And it really is, in a lot of ways, back to the future with the Andy Reid regime. Uh, things have gone back sort of to that mentality, and we'll we'll see how it how it shakes out as camp prog- progresses. But this is a perfect example. Chip didn't do this. He didn't bring in the rookies. Everybody reported at once. So uh, the fact that you have the the quarterbacks and and the rookies together and selected veterans, basically guys who uh, are rehabilitating injuries, they get a little head start and. And then things will gear up for real on on Thursday. Yeah, a couple of the questions that was asked of Doug during the media session was about, you know, 1999, his year ahead of Donovan, and he kept insisting that listen, this is different. Sam Bradford's our starter. Carson Wentz is basically going to redshirt for at least the first half of the season. Chase Daniels, the backup. So, do you think that we will see a full season with that plan that Doug keeps? repeating or is he just saying that to keep the media at bay well it's tough but I think people run with it uh, and and they play with the semantics because what Doug has said is is there's a plan and the plan is Sam is going to be the number one quarterback Chase Daniels is going to be the backup and Carson Wentz uh, is going to be put in shrink wrap bubble wrap whatever you want to call it that's the plan but as we all know we all have plans in life and Sometimes life doesn't care about your plans, and things happen. And the same thing happens in football, and and the fact that if the Eagles struggle, uh, if they're not playing well, obviously if injuries take place, that changes the plan. And there's never been any doubt to that, but this is the first time Doug actually uh, begged off and considered, hey, just because we say Carson Wentz is not going to play, he's the number one three quarterback right now, doesn't mean he's not going to play because so many things can happen uh, during the season that could change that plan. And I think that's what he's uh, trying to say. And he's never really wavered from that. It's uh, I think people are, are always looking for declarative statements and they want concrete things, but you can't just say, hey, this is the way it's going to be. Especially, Josh, think about it. When you have a quarterback like Sam Bradford and his injury history, there's no guarantee he's going to be out there for 16 games. Speaking of Sam Bradford's injury history, one of the things Doug Peterson mentioned at the presser was how important it was 
that Sam Bradford is been healthy during his offseason. He's not coming off an injury, that he's not rehabbing, that he's been able to participate in everything. Talk about the value of a quarterback coming into a new offense like Doug Peterson's to have that full offseason under his belt. Well, it's big for Sam, uh, no matter what offense, because seemingly throughout his career, he's, he's in a new offense every year or every two years at best. But So he's used to it, and he's played this style of offense in the past. So while it's a change from last year, he, he certainly has experience doing it. But uh, the fact that he's been healthy, and this is really the first time in two years he's had an off season, uh, so that, that bodes well for him because – he didn't have an opportunity to prepare uh, during the spring last year and even deep into the summer, really. Uh, if you think about training camp last year, he wasn't uh, a full go at the beginning of camp. He was still struggling and, and still trying to get back from the second ACL tear. So he's he's much healthier. He said today he's gained a, a couple pounds. He's 219, and he, that's what he wants to play at. He's generally played at about... 212 or somewhere in that range so he's bigger he's stronger uh and certainly the, the farther away you get from acl injury just from the mental standpoint you just you feel better about yourself you feel better you have more confidence in your leg so all of that is positive for for sam bradford we're talking with john mcmullen our 97.3 espn eagles insider he also covers the nfl for today's pigskin John, looking at who who exactly reported today of the selected veterans, because we've been hearing that term, you know, leading up to this. So who were among the selected veterans who actually appeared? Uh, Nolan Carroll was there, coming off obviously an injury. Jacory Shepard was there, second year corner, coming off the torn ACL. Cody Parkey was there, the kicker, coming off the core injury. Travis Long, who. As this will be his fourth training camp with the Eagles, the poor guy. He's never played in a, a regular season game. He's had two consecutive ACLs, so he was there. So it's basically guys who didn't do much in the off-season work and, and sort of got a little bit behind, uh, and, and they're trying to get a, a little bit of a head start. The biggest name there, the key, is Nolan Carroll because I think this team looks at him as a potential, and more than potential, the probable starter at cornerback opposite Leotis McKelvin. So uh, he's finally 100% ready to go, and that, that would be the biggest name uh, that people should look at that was there early. Uh, one of the things that Doug Peterson was asked about as well was the cornerbacks. You know, you mentioned Shepard, you mentioned Carroll. Doug Peter was asked about Eric Rowe. Is there any specific impression that you got from Doug Peterson today about how they plan on allowing that cornerback position battle to kind of play out? Yeah, I think we'll get more from, from on that tomorrow when Jim Schwartz speaks because obviously that's his domain. But there's no question, anybody who's followed this team in the offseason, uh, the assumption going into the OTAs was that, okay, the starters are going to be Rowe and, and McKelvey. And Eric Rowe had a really, really, really poor spring, at least in the mind of this coaching staff. And when Doug started talking about the corners today, uh, he was talking about Lee Otis, he was talking about Ron Brooks, he was talking about Nolan Carroll. But he didn't talk about Eric Rowe until he was specifically asked about him. And, and that kind of tells you the mindset of this coaching staff right now he's not in the mix with with those guys uh in the first team and that's a bit of a surprise and it's considering he's a second round pick considering his physical skill set it's a bit of a disappointment but right now he's struggling to pick up this defense and he's got a long way to go speaking of guys who have a long way to go you write at 97.3 espn.com about uh, Isaac Sayamalu about the fact that he is behind the curve and one of the things that Sayamalu mentioned when you guys spoke to him that was interesting was that he views that his versatility is a blessing and a curse that says quote I can play any position but I would like to master one unquote you know talk about your impressions of Sayamalu because this is basically isn't this the first time that we've really seen him at the Novacare Center 
Yeah, the first time since the rookie mini camp. So uh, all the rookies get to go to mini camp after the draft, and then right. uh, he's on the quarter system. Uh, and those specific schools, uh, NFL graduation rule, they're not allowed to be in off season work. Uh, so it not only affected him, but uh, Byron Marshall, the running back uh, from Oregon, also the first time we we got to see him today, and he was pretty impressive. But as far as Sam Alu. Uh, you know, today was a little bit different because there weren't a lot of guys there. So that's the reason he, he played some center. He even played some tackle uh, because there aren't a lot of bodies uh, to work with. And he, and he has that kind of versatility. But there's no question the Eagles want to start him out at left guard. And they want to see if he can push Allen Barber. And uh, I think if you look at where this draft class is shaping up, and the fact that obviously the intent is you're not going to play Carson Wentz. We talked about that. You didn't have a second round pick. Sam Mollis, your third round pick. At some point, ego enters into it. And I think uh, the Eagles are going to give him every opportunity to win that left guard spot because they want to prove they got something out of this draft quickly. That may be not necessarily the best way to build your football team. I agree with that but they like him as a player, and even though he's behind the eight ball, I think he's going to be given every opportunity, even though Doug Peterson said it's Alan Barber's job to lose. You mentioned the fact that when you saw Marshall out there, he looked impressive. What other players that were out on the field today that you saw in different drills and things looked impressive? Well, remember, today was, again, the, the majority of the players weren't there, and certainly big names weren't there opposite the quarterback. So the guys who stood out to me would be Marshall on offense, who just shows a natural ability to catch the ball out of the backfield, and that's very important. Remember, he played receiver at, at Oregon then shifted to running back, so he can do both. Uh, and if you think about Kansas City, you think about Andy Reid, you think about Doug Peterson, they love running backs who can catch the ball out of the backfield. He's just got a natural ability to do that. So, to me, it was him on offense and defense. It was Aaron Grimes, who's a, a cornerback, uh, an ex-CFL guy who was a, a CFL all-star. The Eagles brought him in, and, and he really, really had a good day in coverage, especially uh, with receivers down the field. But, again, it's not – Jordan Matthews isn't out there. Nelson Aguilar is not out there. Ruben Randall, Chris Gibbons, all those guys aren't out there. So while you say these guys were impressive, you understand what the competition was. You, know, you mentioned the injury history of Sam Bradford earlier. Looking at the running back position, Ryan Matthews has an injury history as well. So looking ahead to the season, do you expect the Eagles to maybe carry more than three running backs because of that? Yeah, I mean, when I did my, my 53-man roster projection, I, I had him keeping four and the fourth being Kenyon Barner. But uh, I think now as we get closer, especially a guy like Marshall, uh, because if you think about Barner as a whole, he struggles catching the ball out of the backfield. He doesn't have a great skill set. So the reason I, for this offense, the reason I kept him on that 53-man is for what you just said. They need bodies at that particular position because it's going to be running back by committee. And really, the only gimmies are, are Matthews, Darren Sproles, and Wendell Smallwood. So if a guy like Marshall can catch people's eyes, and I think he did today already, uh, I think there's an undrafted guy who's got a chance to make this football team because they need some bodies at that position because they kind of know it's going to be a committee. John, I want to look over and see a couple other NFL news and notes. Staying in the NFC East, news came out this afternoon that Junior Gallette ruptured his Achilles. He's out for the season. So what kind of blow is that going to be the Redskins? Uh, it's a huge blow uh, for both. I mean, personally, obviously, two straight years. And Achilles are, are just such a devastating injury. I, I, I think it's conceivable we'll never see uh, Junior Gallette play football again. Uh, to go through that injury two consecutive years. Uh, and obviously Washington needed that pass rusher. What he was in New Orleans a couple years ago, they certainly could have used that off the edge. So 
uh, it's definitely going to affect them, and that's obviously part of the NFL, the war of attrition we always talk about. And why talking about who's going to be 11 and 5 or 10 and 6 or 8 and 8 doesn't matter right now because you have no idea who's going to be on the field come September 11th because injuries have large effects on basically every team in this league. Also in the news, Alden Smith and Le'Veon Bell put out some very ill-advised items on their social media platforms. Alden Smith, a video of him lighting up a joint on Periscope, and then Le'Veon Bell, a Photoshop picture of him running around an NFL field with a gas mask on. You know, John, when when are these players going to learn? Because it just seems like these guys, you know, Herm Edwards says don't press send, and we all laugh about it, but there is a little bit of a seriousness to the fact that Seriously, don't don't hit the OK button. Don't press send because you know these guys may be jeopardizing the jeopardizing the rest of their careers. Yeah, not maybe they are, and I, I kind of uh, I'm going to write about that tomorrow in relation to Josh Gordon, who got conditionally reinstated today. He's going to have a four game suspension, but he's allowed to go through preseason work. He's going to be allowed to go to team meetings and things like that. Uh, and I know a lot of people want to vilify Roger Goodell, but one of the few days I will actually defend him. This is not his problem. This is not his issue. These these penalties have been collectively bargained, and, and they're very, very structured uh, on the substance abuse and, and the PED policy side of things. The personal conduct we can argue about, but as far as the drugs, it's very, very structured. All these players understand it. They understand the testing system. And at some point, Josh, personal responsibility comes in the equation. These are supposed to be adults. Uh, adults don't do that. Uh, what Alden, Alden Smith, I, you know, what do you say about him? Uh, there's been so many issues. Uh, it's astonishing that he's only out for a year and not suspended indefinitely. But as far as Le'Veon Bell, he's going down a very, very bad path. And the fact that he wants $15 million, I got news for him. He's not going to get it. Because nobody's going to give him that money for the way he acts. Speaking of Josh Gordon, we spoke about it earlier. I was kind of wondering, is he actually going to stay on the Browns this year? Because now that he's actually been reactivated by the NFL, the Browns could possibly look to trade him or cut him. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. There's been whispers that Hugh Jackson's not entirely thrilled with having that kind of guy in his locker room. So... It's certainly conceivable that Cleveland could look to trade. I don't know who would trade for him. Uh, You're certainly not going to get anything of value, certainly not for what his talents as a player are, uh, because you can't count on him to be on the field. So what are you going to get, a conditional seventh-round pick? Uh, That's better than nothing if they want to go that route, Uh, and they could certainly release him. That's their right. I I would imagine... Cleveland will give him one last opportunity and say, sort of like the NFL is doing it. If you read Roger Goodell's uh, letter to Josh Gordon, he basically states what I just said. It's it's your responsibility. This is on you. Uh, and he didn't say this is your last opportunity, but you can kind of animate it from the words. And, and uh, I think he wants to give him the rope to either succeed or hang himself. And Either way, you can't blame the commissioner for this one. Do you think there's a possibility that Gordon staying with Cleveland may have something to do with RG3 being there because they both played at Baylor together? Well, it could. You, you never put totally out of, you know, former sort of relationships. It could always have an effect, but. I don't really think you is taking that seriously. I, I don't think RG3 has won that starting job by any stretch of the imagination. I think they're going to have a legitimate competition there. So he might not even be the quarterback. And if you think about Josh Gordon's better friend would be Johnny Manziel. So obviously the Browns aren't bringing him back. So <laughs> I, I, I don't think those personal relationships are going to have any effect. I think it all has to do with whether... Hugh Jackson wants him in the locker room or not. I think when he sees him on the practice field and he sees how good he is, uh, he'll give him one last opportunity because talent talks in this league, let's face it. And 
there's few receivers in this game that have more talent than Josh Gordon. Uh, but he's to this point, he's he's obviously derailed his career time and time again. You can follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. He covers the Eagles for 97.3 ESPN.com. And you also can follow him, his work with today's pigskin, where he covers the NFL. John, we're getting back to this daily talk, so I'll be talking to you tomorrow. All right. Thanks, Josh.